Actually, thank you uh, to John, our challenging case presentation uh, number one. And I'm Dr. William Hao from Hong Kong. And together with this session, I have Dr. Hong from Korea as a co-chair. And also, you know, we have a distinguished uh, panelist. Okay, we have uh, Dr. Cha from Korea, Dr. Zhang Su Kwang. Is he here yet? Hey, you're here. Okay, <laughs> from Malaysia. Okay, my good friend. And also, uh, we have Dr. Uh, Cho from Korea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here. Yeah. Cho from Korea. And then we have Dr. Kim, uh, two Kims from Korea. Mm -hmm. Okay, and also we have Dr. Wang from Taiwan. So with no further ado, I'd like to start the first case presentation. Uh, uh, Dr. Lan from Australia, are you here? Okay, so uh, her presentation is going to be changing the course of action for imaging. Please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to present the case on behalf of my team at the Prince Charles Hospital. I have no disclosures. I have a 63-year-old uh, lady presented to emergency department at 3.30 p.m. with burning epigastric pain uh, since morning. She had a background history of hypertension, dyslipidemia, COPD. She's a current smoker with 40-pack year history, high BMI 41.5, and she had a previous cardiac investigations for atypical cardiac chest pain atypical chest pain, CT calcium score was 683 in 2017, and she had an exercise uh, stress echo, which showed no exercise-induced ischemia at low workload. Her medications include atinolol, atorvastatin, and omisartan. On physical examination, she is hypertensive, but there is no um, um, significant difference in systolic blood pressure, no radio radio delay, and cardiovascular examination um, and show heart sounds were jeweled and no significant murmur. And abdomen was soft and mild tenderness in the epigastrium on palpation. ECT showed sinus rhythm with no acute ischemic changes. She had a severe troponins in emergency and which shows negative. The impression was likely gastritis as pain improved with pentoprazol and gastrogel. She was referred to the chest pain assessment service at the hospital and organized outpatient myocardial perfusion scan. She was discharged at 9.30 p.m. When she back home, she still got ongoing pain and called the ambulance at midnight. This is an ECG with the ambulance, which showed a significant ST elevation in the inferior and the precordial leads. We took her to the angiogram, um, which showed um, right coronary artery showed no significant disease. This is our left system, um, which showed a significant disease in the um, uh, proximal LED up to the uh, uh, mid LED. So may I ask who would go for the PCI in this case? Okay. You want to ask and, the panel or? And everyone. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, anybody want to give an answer or we can continue? To the um, left system again. Okay. Okay. So, um, who would um, refer for the cabbage? No one. And who would do imaging? Okay, sure. Um, so we did the IVUS, um, which showed a significant um, uh, dissection um, from the mid LED um, to the left main. So you can see the dissection flap and uh, hematoma. Um, and when you look at the first picture, this is the um, uh, mid LED um, dissection, and uh, this is the proximal LED, and uh, which extends into the left main. So this is around the uh, distal proximal LED. And um, significant hematoma and a dissection all the way. Mm -hmm. 
So very extended uh, the sections um, all the way to the uh, left main. Skip to the left main. So at this point, um, we try to um, wire to the left second flex, um, but uh, possibly because of the intersection flap um, in the false lumen, we could not um, uh, wire into the left second flex. Um, I was um, showed uh, distal left main uh, Emily was six millimeters square. So she had a persistent chest pain and hemodynamic instability. We inserted the um, balloon pump. Um, her troponin came back at 36,000 um, at 1.30 a.m. She had a bedside um, echo. Um, we showed um, uh, ejection fraction was 64%. There is a hypokinesis in the infraceptor and the antral uh, septal. She had a my AR and dilated aortic root 44 millimeter, which is um, um, similar to the uh, previous echo done in 2021. We enable to see the any dissection flap, um, but uh, she has a very high BMI and um, it's difficult um, 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 to do the echo bedside for her. So at this point, our differential diagnosis was SCAT um, is our main differential and left main dissection and the aortic dissection stay a possibility. So how would you uh, manage in this scenario? Would you do PCI for her? Would you do cabbage or would you do conservative management? So we talked to the surgeons at um, that point um, because we had a surgeon, um, cardiothoracic surgeon, sent by, and um, they took her um, to the uh, theater because of the uh, uh, left main, significant left main dissection and um, up to the uh, proximal and mid LED. So this is a transesophageal echo done intraoperatively, which shows significant dissection flap, um, type A dissection. So this is the operative findings. She had a dissected uh, proximal LED long segment and type A dissection, um, trileaflet aortic valve, and she had intimate tear noted in the ascending aorta. The patient had an aort ascending aorta replacement uh, with a 28 millimeter integrated straight graft and aortic valve repair, and she had SVG to LED and SVG to diagonal. Patient was discharged home after two months stay in the hospital. My discussion points, uh, detailed history and clinical findings um, correlate with angiography is very important and should treat the patient, not the angiogram. When you're in doubt, uh, just um, do the imaging. And uh, when would you not use the mechanical circulatory support with such a presentation? In conclusion, IVAS play a pivotal role in not only providing detailed information on the location and the extent of the dissection, but also directing the guide wire into the true lumen. Transesophageal echocardiogram is a key diagnostic modality in patients with acute aortic dissection, but it's difficult to get um, in the middle of the night. Um, and do not forget the CT aortogram, which is the um, first investigation of choice if you suspect acute aortic dissection. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now this case open for discussion. So any comment from the panel? Did you perform the uh, echocardiography at the first visit? So uh, we performed um, after we've done the IVAS and um, after IVAS. yes, after IVAS um, and um, and when thinking about where to go uh, um, uh, to see the um, LVEF and um, any, um, any valve. But um, it's, yeah, it's not from the beginning. It's um, during the um, angiogram. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, so the lady presented with uh, ST elevation MI. No, initially presented with uh, epigastric pain. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, later in the night. Yes. 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 So, um, so my first question is um, for SC elevation MI, uh, you did a CAG. Yes. And uh, it clearly showed that there was significant stenosis of the LAD uh, artery. Yes. Um, is it in the guidelines to perform an IVUS, which might uh, prolong the door to balloon time? Uh, I'm not sure. Perhaps the panel can answer that. That's my first question, yeah. uh, which uh, normally um, I think most of us would go straight to uh, doing a revascularization. Yeah. 
the second question is, uh, did the dissection come about from the manipulation of the catheters um, to have both an aortic dissection at the same time as the uh, STEMI yeah. uh, is, a, is definitely uh, unusual. Yeah. And of course, uh, based on your subsequent suggestions of considerations of maybe a balloon pump and all that would have been detrimental, right? Yeah. So uh, perhaps uh, those would, would be my two questions. Thank you. Yeah, because um, uh, we um, it's a ST elevation MI, but um, the presentation is a bit unusual because uh, she presented on the same day, um, same um, evening, and which is serial troponin is negative, and also no ECG changes, and we suspected um, it's a scat. That's why we did not uh, perform the uh, PCI straight away. Um, and going to the uh, what's the second um, the second question is um, uh, imaging, um, um, so we um, try to do the imaging um, because uh, we're not sure what's going on, that's why. It's, uh, it may delay um, door to balloon time, um, but if you suspect SCAT, uh, um, um, usually conservative management uh, uh, with the um, in mechanical circulatory support um, may improve the outcome. Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. So, so do you think that this, this case is the uh, aortic dissection and uh, simultaneously uh, dissection extending to proximal AD? Yes, so the... There is no, there is no uh, chance to the uh, catheter dissection? Um, we don't think it's an iatrogenic uh, dissection. Uh, we missed the um, aortic dissection uh, from ED. If we um, did the, uh, we think um, if we did the CT aortogram um, when she presented first time, uh, it might show something. Yeah. So it's a, uh, just simple uh, recommendation is that before the uh, angiogram, I think is a, uh, I would recommend that this pre-PCI bedside echo yes. is really, really nice. Yeah, yeah, it will be great. Any more comments from the panel? Dr. Yeah. I think if I, if I get it correctly, the uh, ECG showed an acute inferior MI, right? Um, or oh, ST elevation in all precordial leads as well. Oh, in precordial leads? All well. V1 to V6 um, ST elevation. In, what about inferior leads? Um, in, yes, inferior leads and then all the precordial leads. Yeah. So I think the, like, like what you say is true. The clinical presentation is uh, a bit like, you know, doesn't commensurate with what yeah. you find. Yeah. Um, so, I, I think it's not wrong for you to investigate further before you, you intervene. Yeah. I think what you did is, is, is correct and it is proven finally to be correct. Yeah. So, I think good job. Thank you. Okay, if no further comments or questions, uh, thank you to all of them. Thank you. So, I would like to invite the second speaker, uh, Dr. Yira from India. Uh, his title is going to be RC with anomalous uh, left circumference perfection stenting. Dr. Yura, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Complex PCA for giving me an opportunity. Uh, my topic is uh, RCA with anomalous L6 uh, bifurcation stenting. I'd like to thank my team, uh, Dr. Pragati, Dr. Raju, sir, Dr. Anuj, and Dr. Swarup. And we are from uh, AAG Hospitals, India. Coming to the case details, uh, uh, my patient is a 48-year young lady, a homemaker uh, hailing from uh, Surat, which is a, a place in northern India, uh, diagnosed to have unstable angina with uh, new onset angina on exertion class 3 symptoms over the last three weeks with a good LV function. Uh, she underwent angio elsewhere and came to us for further management. Uh, this is her ECG, which showed sinus rhythm normal axis with uh, no significant ST, ST and T changes. So we reviewed the angio done uh, elsewhere, which showed a dominant RCA with the osteal uh, tight stenosis and an anomalous L6 originating from the right coronary cusp, mm, large size uh, L6 with osteal tight stenosis. Uh, this was her uh, anatomy with a significant uh, symptoms. Now coming to the issues and planning in this case, uh, so we have a doubt whether L6 has a separate origin or it is coming from the RCA. So if separate origin, then our plan was to have a two osteal stunts, like a V stunting. If the L6 is coming from RCA, then uh, it's a true bif uh, bifurcation lesion uh, coming to Medina 111 lesion. So we have options of IVUS versus CT angio. 
So we opted for CT angio uh, to delineate the anatomy. And in the initial angio, the left main ostium was not well profiled. So considering the young lady with uh, only the ostial disease, we thought of uh, profiling the left main ostium and look for uh, uh, arch and the uh, major vessels. So uh, we underwent with CT angio. So CT angio, we can see, showed a short common trunk of 2 to 3 millimeter with a tight proximal RCA stenosis extending 7 to 8 millimeter from the uh, ostium with the anomalous L6 arising from the RCA and the osteoprox tight stenosis extending 3 to 4 millimeter. So coming to the bifurcation strategy in this case, uh, we have provisional stunting versus two stunt uh, strategy. We opted for provisional stunting because according to definition criteria it comes, uh, does not come into complex bifurcation. And there is no, second issue is there is no enough length for the pot. And the rescue strategy in progenital stunting, uh, we have two options, tap versus cool out. We opted for a tap, as the, it is a 90 degrees uh, angle of L6 arising from the RCA. So we went ahead with the procedure. Mm, RCA was engaged with the uh, AR1 uh, guiding catheter. And both uh, RCA and L6 uh, were crossed with the BMW wires. And uh, RCA was pre dilated with uh, 2 into 12 and 2.5 into 12 NC balloons. Once RC is pre dilated, we can see the flow in the L6 uh, got better because the lesion is extending uh, uh, proximal to the origin of L6. And the RCA uh, has been stunted with uh, osteoprox RCA, stunted with uh, 3.5 into 15 mm uh, drug loading stunt. You can see significant waste uh, while deploying the stunt. And the RCA stunt has been optimized with 3.5 into 12 and 4 into 8 mm NC balloons. So once RCA stunt has been, has been optimized, uh, uh, sorry, this there is uh, this, some problem with the uh, video in the second image. There is significant compromise in the L6 ostium once the RCA stunt has been optimized. So to define the L6 ostium, uh, again we have two options, whether to go ahead with IVAS versus F FFR. Uh, we choose FFR because uh, it gives functional significance of the side branch. And uh, L6 has been uh, recrossed with the FFR wire. And the baseline FFR was 0.83 and post adenosine it was 0.64, which showed significance of the side branch. So. We had done kissing balloon inflation of the side branch with the 2 into 12 mm NC in the L6 and 3.5 into 12 mm NC in the, the RCA. So post kissing balloon inflation, we have uh, repeated the FFR. Uh, baseline turned to be 1 and post adenosine it was 0.92. Uh, this was the final result achieved. Actually, the, there is no clarity in this uh, final video image. So it showed the good flow in the L6 and the RCA. Uh, disclosures uh, were none in this case and coming to discussion points uh, for planning the procedure we opt we choose for CT angio to plan the procedure as it gives uh, um, upfront information about the anatomy and uh, to plan for the procedure and for the side branch uh, CVRT we choose FFR as it gives functional significance of the vessel coming to the conclusion uh, imaging helps in planning uh, in such complex cases when you have doubt and CT angio in our case helped in planning the bifurcation PCA and uh, physiological evaluation helps in decision making about the side branch treatment in such bifurcation lesions. Thank you. Okay, and uh, now this case is open for discussion. Any comments from the panel? Dr. Wang? Uh, thanks for your presentation. I have uh, two questions. Uh, first is, uh, do you check IVAS before a procedure? And the second is, uh, as we know, the, uh, the shortcoming of the balloon is a recoil. And if it is a true publication, which you have uh, two osteon lesion, uh, maybe the uh, kissing balloon uh, will cause a uh, late recoil of the second phase osteon. So uh, do you think about the two centenary instead of the uh, uh, balloon? Thank you. Uh. Uh, upfront uh, uh, two strands we did not choose, sir, because uh, in bi according to definition criteria, it does not come into complex bifurcation. So we choose uh, the provisional single strategy. 
At the side branch, lesion length is not extending uh, beyond 10 millimeter. It is only just three to four millimeter. Yes. Um, thank you for the presentation. Over here. Yeah. Hello, sir. Yep. Um, indeed, the anatomy is uh, complex. I don't think uh, there's any dispute about that. Um, can I ask the first CAG, um, was it done by a different team from the one that did the intervention? Or? Yes, sir. Yeah. And just done elsewhere. Exactly. So it was a different hospital, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So that, that would explain uh, the issue of why uh, you know, the first CAG was considered uh, insufficient to delineate the anatomy, which I think would have been adequate. Uh, I don't think the CT, CT would have been useful uh, to delineate that because you were already there. Um, perhaps you just change a catheter to get a nice visual that indeed the circumflex is from the uh, anomalous, anomalously from the RCA. Yes. So, um, I mean, that's what I feel. Um, but um, the second thing is, um, although there is data that maybe a quarter of site branches may not be uh, ischemic, um, I think your IVERS might have been a more useful choice instead of proving what is definitely going to be the case that, you know, the large circumflex with the severe stenosis at its proximal origin would be ischemic, which you proved. Yes, sir. So that's my opinion about that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, actually, I totally agree. You know, but, and for me, you know, I'll stop the I first, for the RCA first. But honestly, you know, uh, after you do the C C CTA, okay, and you, you send mm. the patient back to the cath lab, and you're going to proceed for the PCI. So in that scenario, I think IFS is more useful. So we can look at the pharmacology, look at the vessel size, and from there we can decide you know, how long it stand, what size it stand we should use. And after that, we can use the IFS for this search as well. Yep. All right. So now the question is that uh, you did RCA without imaging. Yes. So we are not sure whether you know, the stand is uh, fully opposed or uh, well expanded. All right. So I think in that scenario, probably IFS will be more useful than FFL. Okay, but since every file you find is uh, positive, okay, so you proceed. But in that case, I think I still do imaging, just to double confirm. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is my comment. So, any questions or any comments from the panel? Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. It's uh, a really nice result. Thank you. So, it's, uh, I have one question. It's, uh, why is the operator decided to the uh, uh, IVUS guidance? Uh, so uh, FFR guidance rather than the uh, IVUS guidance. That is my first question. The second question is, uh, I think is if you are already decided to do this post-PCI FFR uh, assessment for the side branch, so what about the, the first uh, pre-PCI FFR functional assessment in the RCA or circumflex artery? If you've done with this uh, pre-PCI FFR assessment, you is uh, your strategy is more clear. Just the one stenting word is the kissing, uh, to, uh, is the kissing balloon technique or something like that. Uh, yeah. uh, first thing about uh, IVUS versus uh, CT, sir, we had the same uh, discussion, but somehow we went with uh, FFR uh, in our case because it gives a functional significance uh, more than anatomical de delineation. Uh, regarding the second question. Yeah, because uh, you are focused on this uh, functional assessment. Yes, sir. That mm. is the pre-PCI FFR assessment is, uh, is, would be another uh, important point, I think. Pre-PCI FFR, uh, actually the FFR was planned uh, in bit after the stunting the uh, main uh, RCA. Mm -hmm. So upfront we did not have the plan of FFR uh, and uh, based on the CT and uh, anatomical uh, uh, coronary angio, it showed a significant uh, uh, 111 lesion. But so we did not. But it's, we don't know the is the pre-PCI uh, functional significance is the which is the functional significance RCA or circumference. We don't know that at this moment. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, that is my question. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Iwa. So let's move to the first presentation. Thank and you, sir. We would like to invite uh, Dr. Ng from Singapore. Uh, his presentation is going to be conflicting FFL and QFL in patients with angina pectoris. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, 
I'll give a quick presentation of this case, um, which is much shorter than my previous two uh, presenters, uh, but I hope that there's some food for thought uh, with regards to practical management of our patients. Uh, it's not technically challenging, but decision-making is just as important uh, in this case. So I have no disclosure. So it's a 57-year-old gentleman, chest discomfort on exertion, which sounds like typical angina, but uh, not necessarily so for those of us who have practiced for a long time. So he was treated medically for six months by my colleague. And uh, CAG after six months of treatment because of persistent chest discomfort uh, was done. Uh, so what was noted was in the uh, mid uh, LAD, there was a, uh, a, a narrowing as well as an proximal LAD. So FFR was performed by my colleague uh, and uh, it was noted to be at 0.83. Um, my colleague did an IVUS and uh, he reported that there was a 50% stenosis in the mid-segment with an ulcerated plaque. Um, so that prompted him to revascularize, and which he did. And, uh, and so this is the image after revascularization and the FFR remained at 0.83, which is uh, often a concern, uh, you know, because we want to prove that there was improvement in the uh, flow but apparently there wasn't. Um, patient described improvement of symptoms immediately, but one month later, the symptoms recurred. So, um, um, so he came over and uh, sought a second opinion, and uh, that's where I, I'm involved. And um, so I, I decided that let's do another CAG, which is already six months after the PCI, and let's have a look. And uh, this is the uh, second CAG with a very nicely uh, open stand in the mid-segment. Uh, that was performed by my colleague. Uh, the stenosis in the uh, proximal segment is still there. Um, again, FFR was 0.83, which is consistent with the uh, leftover test that was done six months prior. So this time round, uh, after attending Europe PCR this year, and uh, there's some emphasis on QFR, I decided to do a QFR analysis, um, which might be gaining um, uh, acceptance and validation in the next two years, and uh, QFR said it was 0.69. So um, this is where I am. I would like to present this uh, uh, practical dilemma to uh, the panel as well as to the uh, audience here, so that you know at, at least hopefully it will help us in our own practices in the future. Um, so the questions in uh, pertaining to this case would be: uh, Firstly, are the symptoms and FFR a good correlation? Perhaps I can ask the panels. Sorry, I'm asking the panels. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, every year I'm invited to be a faculty, but you know, so I just ask the panels. Any, uh, Anybody is able to answer that question? Okay, I got a question you know, for the FFR. So what is the IC drug dose you use? I just want to make sure you know, the drug dose is good enough. I was up to 300 MCG for the it's Up to 300? Yeah, correct. Okay, so double check already. Yes, good, good point. Okay. Yep. So yeah, symptoms and FFR correlation, I think in our practices can be a bit dubious and uh, ambivalent, but nevertheless, we would like something that is very objective to, to uh, accompany our own subjective uh, understanding of patient symptoms, right? And uh, number two is of course, FFR and QFR correlation. Um, any any uh, comments from the panel? Okay, because if based on the study, you know, the correlation is quite good, honestly. If you look at the favorite study from China, you know, one, two, three, you know, the, the results are really good. Correct. So I think at the moment, we don't have any doubt about that. Right. So how would we apply to this data for my patient? So would the, uh, would, would the remnant stenosis in the proximal LED be actually the culprit? Or as far as ischemia is concerned, maybe not the symptoms, um, would you think that that way? But uh, here the distal reference was measured by the changed geometry by the previous PCI. So I think uh, measuring QFR here is not could not yeah you know, would not be correlated with the true ischemia. Okay. So. Um, the correlation after revascularization might be not true ischemia. So that leads us to the third question, which is, uh, is the culprit lesion, the proximal LAD? And I uh, would really um, appreciate any other recommendations from the panel or the floor. Okay, so for the FFR, do you do the pullback? 
Um, yes, we did the pullback. You did pullback? So yes. But you didn't show us the pullback curve. Uh, no, or... I didn't show the pullback okay. curve, but it's, uh, it's, it's where the proximal lesion might be, yes. Okay, yeah. actually for QF1, now we can do the pullback as well. Yes. So, I mean, if you can show us the pullback curve, you know, then you can give us some ideas, you know. Then now if I just look at this, you know, uh, first of all, you know, there's, I, I'm not sure whether the QF1 is really correct or not. Okay. Because there's sometimes maybe human error involved. Sure. And especially for the FF1, you know, as I say just now, you know, if the drug dose is not good enough or can be also PA. I'm not sure whether PA is correct or not. Sure. All right. So there's a lot of questions about this case. And then you show us the PA, PD readings, you show us the pullback. Then from there, you know, we can decide you know, what's causing the problem. Sure. So let's say we went with FFR alone, neglecting the, uh, ignoring the QFR of 0.83 after revascularization. Uh, would it be considered... Um, Successful. So anybody is able to answer? I just, that? Uh, I just wondering, uh, uh, do you, uh, did you have a QFR for the pre-PCI for the media lady? Ah, no, it wasn't available at the time. I think uh, on a practical basis, it only came in after your PCR this year. So no, uh, the CAG, the first PCR was done in January this year. Mm. Okay, but you can, you can always go back to the QFR. Yes, you can. Yeah, yeah. so I think you can double check you know, just to make sure. sure. But in terms of FFR post PCI 0.83, um, I guess there is some remnant ischemia. If we believe FFR, would that be correct? I guess so. Huh? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, do to, to make things uh, a bit more, um, I mean, provoking. Huh? Yes. What if you? What if this? patient were to see another person who is not interventional, yes. okay, order a uh, non-invasive uh, ischemic assessment, a yes. BB scan, for example. Yes. All right, which I think probably would not be so open to human error, but of course there is still uh, uh, a space for false possibility. Huh? Yes. And uh, False negative, you mean? Yeah, false negativity, yes. sorry. Huh? Yeah. So, and you get any divergence yes. in findings, yep. so how will you interpret? Yeah. Uh, I actually did my training with Daniel Berman and Cedar Sinai for my, for my first training. From Singapore, we send ourselves, our guys overseas. So I, I'm very sure it won't be a scheming on the MPI. So yeah, so, so uh, I, it would be nice if there's a divergence. That will really uh, help me out. Yeah, but uh, so anyway, uh, I'm just moderating patient symptoms now and uh, just moderating his expectations. Uh, yeah. But to be fair, I think his, his uh, symptoms are more atypical than typical. Thank you for the input. Yeah, uh, I have a one to comment is that we, we just think about this, that, uh, two things is one thing is that uh, this patient is a shootable for the FFR. Yeah, I have no idea is that this patient is chronic uh, CCS or ACS situation. What do you think that this patient is CCS or? I'm your, sorry, I... Uh, stable angina? Ah, yes, it's stable angina. It's yeah. not honest. So it's a FFR is okay, but one of the things is we have to uh, remember is the FFR value, uh, it can say that above, beyond is above the 0.80, we never ever touch the, this uh, lesion. Yeah, but is the, if the FFR value is below the 0.8, it depends on the page, uh, is case by case. We can touch the, this uh, lesion or not. Yes, correct. Okay. So we are guided by uh, the deferred study and the FAME studies, right? Um, that uh, it's, it's, it's more or less in terms of prognosis eh? mm -hmm. um, rather than symptom correlated. And, and that's completely correct. So it's always helpful. Uh, gray areas always exist. Um, you know, you can call it 0.75 to 0.8 level, uh, range. Eh? But regardless, yes, that's correct. So in terms of prognostically improving patients' uh, outcome, uh, revascularization above 0.80 doesn't produce benefit. That's uh, exactly true. So, but in terms of symptoms and the success of the first C, uh, PCI, I, I think I, I have some. So I probably will not uh, revascularize him anymore uh, for my own uh, safety. Uh, yeah, maybe a third opinion might be better, yeah? And yeah. So we, we don't know this uh, is, the, is the medication history, so is, uh, could you... Uh, his medication history, um, I think um, in terms of uh, his uh, anti angels I think he's uh, on uh, moderate dosing. Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. Okay, thank you for your time. All right. Okay, next, next speaker is Dr. Chung from Hong Kong. Topic is...
my first OCT guided PCI for ST elevation MI is a junior. Dr. Chuang, please. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. This is Raymond from uh, Hong Kong. I'm happy to present in complex PCI to, uh, this year. The topic I'm going to share about is my first OCT guided PCI for STEMI as a junior. Our patient um, is Mr. Chen, a 68-year-old man who is a chronic smoker with history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia. He presented to us with acute onset of chest pain at 12 o'clock midnight while watching TV. ECG on admission showed sinus rhythm with ST elevation from V2 to V5, suggestive of anterior STEMI. He was treated with thrombolytics during non-office hour and sent to CCU uh, for observation. So we sent the patient to CAT lab the next day morning for pharmacoinvasive PCI. Diagnostic coronary angiogram was performed uh, with JL4, JL4 via right radio access. Live procedure video was recorded in this case. The most striking finding is the critical disease at proximal to mid LAD with TIMI free flow. There's also um, the uh, minor disease over left uh, distal circumflex artery. For the uh, right coronary artery, um, there is some minor disease and um, it is dominant. So obviously the culprit artery is the LAD and we would do PCR to the LAD. So um, OCT was used as a choice of intravascular imaging in this case um, uh, for our PCI. We, we do OCT before and after uh, the PC, uh, PCI. The pre-PCI OCT we would like to uh, use to determine the treatment strategy. So we are going to set up the OCT. The Dragonfly Opstar imaging catheter was being pushed and it is connected to our imaging system, the Optus um, system. So um, we are connecting uh, both um, together. So after connecting uh, them successfully, we deliver the Dragonfly Opstar imaging catheter to the LAD. The imaging catheter was being purged with contrast, followed by calibration. So I press and hold on CINI and, in and inject the contrast within the time frame of 15 seconds. Rapid pullback was being initiated. The OCT is now analyzing and processing the images. So the OCT is um, analyzing the images. So we are trying to assess the morphology of the lesion. So um, from the proximal um, to the uh, distal side of the LAD. So we are looking for the lesion morphology. We are trying to locate the landing zones of our stent. For this window, we are interested to look for the distal landing. For this window, we are trying to look for the proximal landing zone of our stent. And for this window, we are trying to look for where this um, cursor shows. So this is the concluded scene of our OCT. So for the uh, total stand length, it is around 64 millimeter. So at least two or more stands are required. For the distal landing, the EEL is estimated to be 2.59. So the stand size will be rounded down to 2.5 millimeter. For the proximal landing, the uh, luminal area is uh, 3.18. So the stand size will be rounded up to um, 3.5. So um, after the guidance of the OCT, we also wired the left circumflex artery for protection. The first stent, SANS 2.538 stent, was deployed at uh, mid LAD at up to uh, 14 atmosphere. So um, second stent, uh, uh, SANS uh, 3.528 was uh, delivered to uh, proximal LAD at 14 atmosphere with overlapping with the previous stent. After that, we are going to do the post-stand dilatation. We use um, NC-TRAC um, 2.515 and also NC-TRAC uh, 3.515 to serially dilate um, our stands at up to 18 atmosphere. So, 
after um, after the uh, dilatation, we also do angio to um, show uh, to look for our arteries. The angiographic expansion uh, result was good, and the expansion seems well, and there is um, the flow is good. However, as mentioned before, we still do another OCT after PCR to look for our expansion result. So this is our second run of OCT. The imaging cavity was already in LED, and the OCT can make use of AI to automatically identify the stand from the proximal to the distal um, region of LED. So the stand seems to have a nice expansion here. But uh, upon closer look, we can um, see there is some um, orange color here. So which is areas of under expansion highlighted by the OCT despite our post-stand dilatation with um, 3.5 balloon just now. So the um, under expansion percentage is um, around 74% and the uh, usual cutoff is um, 80%. So this is the concluded scene of the OCT. We can see uh, despite uh, post stand dilatation, there is still um, area of under expansion of only around 74% highlighted by AI with orange color. So with the information in mind, um, we are going to uh, repeat post stand dilatation again. So we use um, NC3 3.0 12 balloon to dilate the underexpanded area highlighted by um, OCT just now. So we dilate the distal part and also the proximal part. And then we would repeat OCT again to look for the expansion result. The imaging cavity was uh, purged uh, with contrast after being delivered to the LED followed by um, calibration. I press and hold on Cine and inject the contrast within the suggested time frame of 15 seconds. Rapid pullback is initiated and we can see the stands here. So um, this is our stand. As usual, it is highlighted by AI from the proximal to distal region. And we can see um, the stand um, seem to have um, better expansion. So um, we try to look for the stand um, from proximal to distal again. So, so upon closer look, there's no more orange color. So we uh, suggest um, the expansion results have been improved um, after another post-stand dilatation this time. So we compared our second run of um, OCT with the third run of OCT. Um, the areas of under expansion has um, finished. There's uh, no more orange color. So um, we repeat angio after the OCT. So this time the final angio shot uh, looks uh, excellent. Um, the extense, uh, expansion is good with a nice flow and there is um, no more, uh, no acute uh, complications compared with uh, when patients just arrive at the cat lab. So um, the patient was discharged three days later with um, no more chest pain. So OCT was used as a choice of um, intravascular imaging in this case for sizing and landing of lesion. Compared with IFIS, it is better in terms of image clarity, faster pullback, assessment of calcium, and a semi-automated interpretation function. However, um, its advantage mainly involves its requirement of blood clearance, thus making it less versatile than IFIS for um, certain lesion subset. So we usually, we usually do OCT before and after uh, PCI if we use it as the, our choice of intravascular imaging. For pre-PCI OCT, we are interested to look for MLD, which stands for morphology, length, and diameter to determine our strategy of PCI. For post-PCI OCT, we are interested to look for MAX, which stands for medial dissection, apposition, and expansion to guide our um, stand uh, deployment. In our case, our OCT was equipped with our latest um, software Ultron, which makes good use of AI to facilitate our PCI. It can use AI to automatically detect arc degree and thickness of calcification to identify uh, highly calcified lesions to uh, guide us to whether to use a more advanced strategies such as rotoblation or CSI for lesion preparation. It also has a function of AI to detect EL and lumen to identify landing zones and also diameter and, stand of, um, and length of stand. 
Thirdly, in some OCT, it is uh, equipped with co-registration, which allows side-by-side -side viewing of live and co-registered NGO to help us to guide um, stand deployment. Finally, um, its review function, just like in our case, can help us to improve um, stand expansion and position result by uh, uh, live uh, uh, display. So in our case, um, OCT can help us to improve our expansion results with its um, AI function and can help to improve um, the angiographic outcome. And it comes to the end of my presentation. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, are there any comments or questions? I have a simple question. Uh, congratulations on your excellent result. But uh, when I see these uh, cases, uh, if we know about the more information about the region, like OCT or IVES, then the stand length is more longer. And so is there any chances or possibility to reduce the stand length for the OCT data? Or in, in the patient, the patient uh, get the stand is more than 60 millimeters, mm. yeah, longer than 60 millimeters and over not enough to one stent, so you you use uh, two stent for that. So is there any possible, there is a only couple of lesion for the treatment in this patient, and there is a law for the OCT in this case patient? So um, since, um, so, so in acute case, for example, in uh, primary PCI, so we usually um, try to do the PCI as quickly as possible in order to fix um, the culprit lesion. But however, um, in this case, um, it is a pharmacoinvasive PCI. The patient was already stabilized uh, with uh, thrombolytics. So um, we can do the PCI with um, more timely manner. So in this case, we use um, OCT as a choice of intravascular imaging, and the stand length was estimated to be more than um, 60 millimeters, so uh, more than uh, two uh, stands are used. So whether to use uh, one stand or two stands really uh, depends on uh, we use the um, uh, intravascular imaging as well. So if more information are collected, so uh, it may guide us to have more uh, extension of the stand coverage. Thank you. Uh, we are behind the schedule, so we will move on to the next presentation. Thank you. Next speaker is uh, Dr. Modi from India. Uh, topic is left main stenting done with provisional approach. Can imaging with IBUS make a difference? Please. So, <clears throat> first of all, I thank uh, the management to have called me and uh, present my case. Cases, it's a series of cases for the left main. The left main stenting done with provisional approach, can imaging with IVUS make a difference? There are no conflict of interest. First patient is 79 years old male, came with angina on exertion, class three, chest pain, dyslipidemic, hypertensive, with a family history of coronary artery disease. You can see the angiogram uh, that revealed uh, double vessel disease, LAD and LCX was diseased. Uh, this was the IVUS pictures. Left main was diseased, uh, the tightest point, the LED ostium you can see, and the distal reference diameter. So left main wa was hooked with the EBU 3.56F catheter and crossed with a BMW wire. LED <coughs> LCX with a floppy wire and 2.75 into 38 deaths in LED, depending upon the, the reference diameter from LED, was deployed at 14 atmosphere. Then a four into 22 millimeter DES in left main to LED at 16 atmosphere, uh, based on the size of the left main. Uh, then a two point, uh, then uh, after the pot, a 2.5 into 12 millimeter stent in the LCX at 14 atmosphere using a tap technique. Then finally, a kissing balloon was done with 2.5 balloon in LCX and 3.5 balloon in left main to LED. Uh, the IOS images during kiss, uh, after kissing balloon are sh uh, there, seen there. Uh, 
So this was the final result. So another patient, 73 years old male, diabetic, hypertensive, angina and exertion, dyspnea exertion. Angiography revealed left main disease, LED 90%, LCX 85%. Again, the tightest point, left main reference diameter, LED ostium. 3.5 into 28 dash deployed in mid LCX first. And then 3.5, 12 millimeter dash deployed in the distal LCX. Pre dilatation uh, to the LED done with the 2 into 8 millimeter balloon, then 3.5 into 38 dash deployed in from mid to distal LED, and 4 into 38 dash deployed from proximal to mid LED. Another dash deployed from left main to LCX. Again, a tap technique, kissing balloon done, 3.5 balloon in left main and uh, 4 in the LED. So there was still, uh, because of uh, um, uh, when we saw in the IVAS, there were there was mal apposition, uh, the minimal lumen diameter was less, which was the, then the pot was done, a better apposition achieved with a five millimeter balloon pot. And this was the final result. Another patient, 59 years old, female, non-diabetic, angina on exertion and dyspnea on exertion of three, angiography revealed triple vessel disease, Again, LD, LED ostium, you can see a concentric calcium, tightest point on IVAS, not able to cross it. So we used IVL using a smaller balloon of 1.5 and making our way for the IVL balloon. The 40 pulses given in LED using 3 into 12 millimeter IVL catheter, pre dilatation done with 2.5 millimeter balloon. The, you can see after the eye wheel, uh, the, this is a sink VN, which gives a very good view of a better than stent boost uh, by Philips, which gives a very go good uh, view of the expansion of the balloons and stents. They're very clearly visible. Uh, this is uh, then 2.5 into 28, that has deployed in mid LED, 3 into uh, 22 in, at the austral LED, and pre dilatation with 1.5. 15 balloon. Uh, again, in LCX also, uh, 40 pulses given with a 2.5 IVL catheter, then 2.25 dash deployed, and 2.5, it was a small vessel. Um, uh, we couldn't cross the IVS actually, but uh, uh, on visual impression, uh, the 2.5 was looking uh, small, uh, bigger for this, so we used 2.25 millimeter deaths uh, in the mid LCX, but 2.5 deaths in the proximal LCX. The patient was on uh, IABP. Uh, we did a protected type of a PCI, which was not a, a mechanical support like Impella, but uh, we took the patient on uh, uh, IABP and uh, uh, completed the procedure. This was the final result. So to conclude, the multi-layered provenal strategy remains the treatment of choice for left main bifurcation lesions in provenal stenting. Second stent can be deployed is and when required. There is a considerable role of IVS imaging and physiology in optimizing the results and improving outcomes. IVL has emerged as an important tool for left main bifurcation calcified disease. Sync VN from Philips gives important information with clear dog boning and subsequent expansion of the stent. Kissing balloon is an important step in left main bifurcation strategy. Proper technique is important to prevent futures, future side branch occlusions. Double kissing in various techniques give better results. IVAS imaging can identify the under expansion during kissing technique. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have two minutes for discussion. Uh, please give us the, just one or two questions or comments. From the panel. So actually, I got a question. You know, for last case, uh, you did IVS before the stenting, and then after the stenting, you did, do you do IVS again or just use a single shot? Uh, no, I didn't do post uh, stenting uh, IVS because I, I wanted to uh, shorten the procedure. I already did it on IVS. The patient was okay. not hemodynamically not very stable. So I avoided uh, the st uh, full steps like doing I was two, three times. I just did uh, check the calcium and uh, uh, 
uh, and the size of the vessel. That's what. Okay, so after standing, you have to do IBIS. You yeah. just use extinguisher. But the problem is, uh, but to me, you know, I always say, you no, know, uh, is a poor man IBIS. Okay, uh, you cannot use extinguisher to replace IBIS. <laughs> so, uh, can you repeat uh, what I mean? I always say, you know, uh, extinguisher is a poor man IBIS. Okay. Okay, but you yeah. cannot use extinguisher to replace IBIS. Yeah, since since uh, you already opened the IFS, no, I feel you know, it's better to do IFS even that standing. That's that's true. In a uh, but in a uh, in our experience, uh, in a calcified lens when we treat, uh, I have a publication in Jack right now uh, where I have described uh, a flow chart how to uh, go in uh, a flow chart like uh, so if we have a superficial calcium depending upon the different types of. Uh, 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 different type of calciums like superficial, deep, nodular, all these things. In last of the flow, th that has been accepted in Jack, will be published soon. Uh, in, the, in the last step, I have given an additional step of palpating the artery. Maybe we are doing imaging also, that's, that's very true, there, there is no, no denying to that fact. But uh, palpating the artery with a balloon uh, sometimes like surprises us uh, and uh, it gives a good idea that the, our strength is like because uh, uh, the the proper sink vein we have that gives very good image and identification of any unexpanded area of course uh, the imaging is the uh, 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 main, main uh, uh, thing to see the expansion is imaging. There's, there is no doubt about it. We need to know the expansion, otherwise we cannot say that the stent is properly deployed or not. But uh, if, if for a poor, uh, poor, uh, like sometimes we don't have, like uh, this, this patient was very um, sick, we tried to like lessen the steps, whatever we could. That, that was the idea behind it. Okay, uh, thank you for all the speakers and panelists and audiences. I will close this session, thank you. Thank you.